I went in through the uh, military program at uh, the ROTC program at uh, University of Georgia. Well, I, I'd been very seriously uh, interested. I was about uh, to be uh, to, within two weeks going to uh, the University of Georgia as a freshman uh, when uh, Germany invaded uh, Poland. And I'd read enough, and my father, if he had been uh, in World War I and, and had been overseas, uh, knew enough uh, that we all should worry. Uh, and I, I feared Hitler's advance wherever he went. Well, it was Sunday afternoon, and I was uh, um, at the fraternity house, and, and uh, uh, about to get out to some studying for the next day uh, after lunch, and, uh, and of course well, I didn't do any studying. We had somebody ran down the stairs and made the announcement about Pearl Harbor. Believe it or not, there, there were uh, uh, there were a lot of people who didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, and we just said Pearl Harbor, and. Uh, Frankly, I wasn't sure uh, where it was located, and because uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, and, and I had not had any experience with the, with the travel there, travel there. So I, uh, there was some question. There were a whole lot of people explaining to a lot of other people. Some of the people uh, in the fraternity had had already uh, left uh, to uh, join the service, and that gave us a little more knowledge about what was going on. Well, uh, I, I had, had thoughts about uh, uh, knowing that ultimately uh, our side would win. I remembered uh, people talking about how we had kept uh, selling scrap metal to uh, Japan for so long, even, even before this. Uh, I was not aware, nor were any of the people that I associated with of a, of a big threat from from Japan and my thoughts were well how long you know to, to, how long and where and in what direction uh, from a personal standpoint I think there, there wasn't a question uh, when I went that uh, that I would try to participate in ROTC simply because of my father's service and he felt that it would be important. He, he uh, recognized the importance of the kind of discipline the military has, the uh, respect that they, they uh, try to in, engender in other people. He said uh, he, he was interested in my uh, patriotism and loyalty, but he's also interested in my being careful and uh, he was very much interested that I would, looked like I would be going to, to Europe, and he had been there. And his main job in during World War II in the um, uh, news Argonne section had been as an ambulance driver, so he knew the worst part of the, of the infantry. Actually, I remember being distressed by. Um, the fact that people who had experienced war before in their in their towns and villages and there were kids and teenagers and others trying to grow up in a peaceful world and and it wasn't happening again and uh, I, I'd had great hopes that that the peace peace would prevail earlier on as I, as a teenager. Georgia had uh, uh, gone to the only Rose Bowl game on January the 1st, 1943, and uh, I had kind of hoped that uh, since I uh, had graduated uh, early, I was in the class of 1943, but graduated in 1942 in December, and I hoped that as part of my time before I reported to Fort Benning that uh, I might get to go 
to the Rose Bowl game, and my father wanted to do that, but there was no way that uh, even a serviceman could be guaranteed transportation priority that I could get back by the 3rd of January, which is the, the morning I was supposed to uh, report in Fort Benning. If you were in the four-year program, between the third and fourth year, uh, you went to uh, the military camp, and uh, that made it possible to graduate uh, as an officer, as a second lieutenant. Uh, however, in the speed-up program, they knew that we had to get there as soon as we could get available. Uh, we were required to go take a full course and uh, enough other courses to graduate during the summer so that in December uh, we could graduate authentically uh, six months earlier than we would have. And that made it necessary to go to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Fort Benning and go through the officer's training program along with enlisted men who had been sent from the ranks and there were about half college kids and half uh, people who'd come from the, the, uh, the enlisted ranks and it, that made it tough but it, it, was, it was a great advantage to uh, have respect for those guys and to, and to make it possible for them to respect us and we were we were in the same boat uh, as it turned out. It was tough to to stay there and to go through. The physical part was was very hard and a lot of pressure. And we used to call that the lowest form of humanity. <laughs> but, uh, it it was and we, and we used to say sometimes that uh, combat would be would be better. But uh, we were wrong about that, of course. There were several uh, close friends who were uh, in the same uh, class at, at Fort Benning as I and had assignment, even a couple of them had assignment to uh, uh, Fort Jackson, but um, one of them was killed in Italy and uh, uh, one other was uh, killed in uh, Battle of the Bulge. Well, in the very last week at Fort Benning, they sent me to, uh, uh, had orders to uh, go to, to Fort Jackson and report as a, a replacement uh, second lieutenant, which I did in late April of 1943. Uh, plain platoon leader, uh, rifle platoon it's called, and uh, uh, I was assigned to uh, B Company of the uh, Infantry Battalion and the, uh, or to A Company and the B Company man said it was his turn so they, they were friends from college and they fussed at each other so I switched companies and uh, it was a great time of training for me as well as uh, helping the adjustment of uh, kids who uh, yeah, that, that that division was filled with uh, um, uh, people that came as a result of lowering the draft age to 18. So we had a lot of young high school football players and so on, and uh, it, it was a great experience, a great training experience, uh, physically very hard, but uh, you could... Uh, see the results later on because uh, we, we never realized how, how serious physical stamina uh, would be. Then the whole division with that platoon went to Tennessee Maneuvers, which was another tough kind of thing uh, physically and weather-wise in the wintertime. And then with the same group to uh, uh, Camp Atterbury, and from there, after a couple of months, I received orders to go overseas as a replacement. Uh, at that point, I went to uh, Camp Shanks in New York, and uh, I'm not sure 
I, I don't remember how many days I was there. Uh, it was uh, pretty short, though. You wanted to be able to get leave and and uh, and talk to your parents. You you were not supposed to tell them where you were, uh, but you told did tell them that. Uh, when you were talking to them, that could be the last time they would hear from you. And he's, you kept repeating that until it was true. Uh, and, and you, of course, were told when you had new orders, you could not make any phone calls, whatever. By a uh, convoy and a small banana boat, believe it or not, uh, belonged to the United Fruit Line, uh, about probably 50 ships in all. Uh, to uh, Scotland and from Scotland down into the west of England until we had uh, further orders to go. Uh, we kept getting uh, another group and another group and he wound up with uh, a group of 250 uh, uh, junior officers. By then I'd had a promotion to first lieutenant and uh, at the last minute before getting on another ship in uh, uh, in England, they put uh, little red circles, they called us a red ball uh, express outfit, and they used that a lot. It had developed as a, as a high priority. But the whole objective was, was uh, moving uh, from there into, uh, into Normandy. And becoming, and that obviously, uh, the priority status of that group uh, meant that that was a uh, pretty, uh, pretty high count of casualties, uh, and that, of course, that's true. Uh, there were a whole lot of ca higher percentage of casualties, and you know, we started out, I guess, in when we first started learning about war, we figured if you were uh, had the status of something like that, you could be back behind the tree or a wall or something, but that didn't work out. When we got there and went out, this was, I don't know how many days after D-Day it was, and I never have been able to uh, to recall that, but uh, they, you, they marched you off. We, we actually got on the landing uh, the LCI, the infantry thing, and they dropped the front, and you stepped off in the water this deep and so on. And uh, uh, when, you, when you got up there, you followed the, we all followed the same path. And I've been there and looked at the little spot where we did uh, through the dunes at Utah Beach. Uh, and then as you went, they directed you into a hedgerow and they just counted people, no records or anything. And uh, they had to, Apparently they'd been told, okay, get so many junior officers over here and we'll pull them out for somewhere later on. And I don't know how long I did that. I actually did some patrolling as, you know, two or three guys to do that. But later, I signed to the 5th Division as their first officer replacement. The hedgerows are grown, are, well, they're the edges of fields and little roads with farm tracks that have worn the earth down. Uh, they weren't built up, they were there. And the farming over the centuries has, of course, uh, uh, made the hedgerows this high. They're where they were in the, the, the farmland, pastures or whatever, uh, is off of wearing down. Uh, and there were, of course, any, anywhere you were, you know, there were Germans close by, and they had protection. We had the same protection we did. Uh, and my first uh, day as, as assigned to the 5th Division, I was, uh, the company commander sent me out on patrol, and I was so much younger than he and less experienced. But I took a couple of guys with me, but I, I was in front, and we were supposed to discover uh, just how close the Germans were. Uh, uh, I was crawling along on the uh, one side of the hedgerow, and uh, 
suddenly I heard German being spoken on the other side, probably you know, ten feet away. And we still were lying. He was obviously was lying down. But after we, um, I was of course stopped crawling and got kind of flat. And uh, the the uh, well, I, I had an explosion. And then on my backside, I you know, I felt real pain and, and numbness. And I had two grenades in my in the pockets, and I sort of spread them out and flattened out in the sand. And and I guarantee that my thought was, how am I going to tell my father that I got hit in the behind uh, by first patrol? Well, I felt back there no blood, and, and uh, uh, turned out that a little concussion grenade, which is filled with uh, uh, air, uh, not like a, uh, a shrapnel grenade. And the German, they tapped them on the arm them by tapping them on the helmet and then tossing them for mostly psychological reasons. Well, it worked for a little bit because uh, I found out that it had knocked a piece of bark off of a tree and it was the bark that hit me. And I had no million dollar wound or anything else. I just had pain there and was embarrassed, actually. For a few days, there were, we were uh, in sort of a stable uh, situation. We did patrolling. Uh, and uh, another patrol that I did, it took a couple of guys, I climbed over a fence, and I, I um, saw my first, the first. The body of, of a uh, uh, dead uh, uh, paratrooper, uh, uh, the All American Division, and I wondered how that how that happened. And then I realized that uh, we were wearing leggings, not boots, uh, and uh, the leggings had a buckle on them, and uh, the buckle of his uh, legging had caught a. Uh, booby trap cord and he'd been killed by it and as I jumped on over the fence I found out that the spent booby trap that my legging had a if I'd been first I'd have been the one to do it because I didn't see it but I had caught it as well and then we proceeded up to uh, uh, in the pasture area and a lot of cows and no Germans that particular trip. Uh, we found some water where we could fill our canteens and use our tablets, and um, halazone tablets. And I suggested we do that and then we went on a little farther and we uh, realized in astonishment that uh, there's a dead cow lying across that little stream and the, and the water was pouring over the cow. And, it was a question about throwing it out. We thought, no, uh, if we used our halazone tablets, it, we couldn't spare the fresh water. That was a big, very big problem, of course. We call them halazone tablets. Um, and that is the right name. I've, for, I've forgotten what they made up of. We, we used them after the war for uh, spring water, if, if you went to the lake or something like that, and you wanted to use drinking water you weren't sure about. We needed to know in in our area uh, how close the enemy was, and if we, uh, of course, uh, part of it was you drew fire. You found out when somebody shot at you, and that was the case a lot of times. But uh, uh, and and that was the idea of, of finding out how much resistance they had, because we were we didn't know at the moment. Uh, how soon we'd try a breakout, uh, but uh, shortly uh, I watched. We were able to watch from some distance back the bombing of Saint Lo, which was destroyed and made possible the the exit from from our area. Well, the orders were to uh, to grab onto vehicles. Now, now, they weren't basic vehicles for 
for infantry units. There were some basic, but not enough to ride on. But uh, during, during World War II, there was a lot of ride hitching on, uh, on an attached artillery battalion's vehicles or uh, tank battalion's vehicles sometimes, uh, command uh, jeeps, messenger uh, cars, and that sort of thing, even every now and then a motorcycle, but we didn't use many of those. The Germans did. Uh, but uh, that was the idea. And then we, we were in a convoy, and we passed through St. Lowe and uh, headed toward uh, a town called Avranche, which is almost in sight of, uh, of uh, Mont Saint Michel on, in, in, in Brittany by then. Uh, and at that point, uh, we realized there's a lot of air activity and uh, uh, American air. Like we had air superiority by then in the daytime. And uh, uh, we found out later how close the Germans had come to uh, uh, cutting us off. They were within, actually they were within sight of, of Mont Saint Michel while we were passing through. And the Air Force was pretty much responsible for cut, cutting that off. Uh, in, in addition to the 30th Division, which uh, was, has been written about in a book called uh, uh, Mortain. It's, it's there, and that was a little village where they were able to uh, to hold. It was it was a very key uh, operation for them to keep us from getting cut off. And then we branched out, and for a number of days we uh, we were able to hop onto vehicles and walk some and ride some uh, uh, toward Lyon and uh, uh, Le Mans actually was a, was a place that we remembered because of the races and so on. Uh, and they, uh, there were attempts, many attempts by the Germans to, uh, to cut us off. It, it developed that uh, the Germans announced that our Air Force that day had seriously wounded uh, General Rommel. Uh, and then they announced in, in another, another day that he had died as a result of it. Well, it wasn't until much later that we found that they had uh, made, uh, made him commit suicide. I was in, in, uh, in command of the second platoon of uh, the first battalion of the 10th Infantry, which was a part of the 5th Infantry Division. Well, uh, most everybody knew you had to you had to have the authority and express it and say, look, we got to, you know, this is what we've got to do. And it was of paramount importance that you tell them what the objective is, which helped them to know there was a reason we were doing this thing. Uh, sometimes you missed, and sometimes uh, the objective wasn't that you didn't turn out, you had to uh, maneuver a little bit. Uh, and uh, that, that wasn't necessarily bad, but the guys had to have respect for the one that was telling them what they had to do. And uh, there was no question about it. It, it, was, uh, it was a matter, and, and I, I know it was widespread uh, and um, widely misunderstood that you established a, a relationship uh, with with the guys, whether they were uh, some of them you've known all this time, they teased me when I uh, joined them as the first officer replacement, and uh, uh, because they were older and had been in the regular army, and uh, a couple of them said, "You know, if you survive us a week, we believe you'll make it." And uh, I. 
I, I did, and our friendship survived, for, and we've had reunions of that particular company for 35 years, uh, which meant a, a whole lot about our respect for each other. And that wasn't isolated. I, I, I think it's, uh, you just, we just, we cannot depend on authority itself. It has to be pretty much a genuine thing, no matter how, how tough it is. We traveled at such speed that, well, in this particular central area, uh, um, where we were trying to catch up with the Germans. And occasionally we did, and we'd stop, they'd stop at a village, a certain one that, that was uh, across the road we were in, and uh, they'd have, have some resistance, maybe, whatever they had to resist with. Uh, and we used a lot of artillery to, uh, uh, in that case, and we were, we were free to do it, uh, uh, I guess emotionally, simply because the, the towns had been evacuated. Our version of of the uh, the 105 millimeter, uh, mainly um, howitzer, it was called. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, it was it it was uh, inferior to the 88s that the Germans had. The uh, German 88 had the muzzle velocity of a rifle, and that was why they could even snipe at people, and I, I've seen them do that uh, uh, with it. But we directed the artillery, and we tried to outmaneuver, and, and uh, at times when they had been going so fast, you found a small group who didn't want to do much resisting. Uh, and the tough thing was when you dealt with that resistance and you found there had been a few civilians left and that they had been hurt or injured and we were pretty careful to see that they had medical treatment too. Occasionally they would be very angry and they would know that, that it was your guns and, and uh, we had a family say that one time after we finally took the little town and it had it had been a terrible experience and a big loss and uh, for us simply because they had uh, observation on, on us in the open area and uh, we found a little somebody came running to us with a little girl who had a serious arm uh, injury and uh, they told us that it was our artillery that had done it well we got uh, we were very careful to be sympathetic to them, and they had been so uh, mistreated by uh, by the enemy. They, the people that were left as we traveled, they tried to insist. They they did insist that they evacuate toward us, uh, and that was a uh, that that was. Uh, a big problem with them. A lot of people were killed, and they were killed along the side of the road with horse-drawn carriages, with all of their uh, everything they owned. It seemed like at home. Uh, that was hard to see. Uh, even the dead horses, you know, was, uh, and the dead cows in Normandy. And there were thousands and thousands of them. In the Mets area, uh, we, uh, which was not not far from. Uh, uh, the German border, of course. Uh, we were uh, several uh, kilometers away from the Moselle River, and we got orders to uh, uh, make a river crossing and to attack uh, some high ground on the other side of the river. Uh, I visited a little town where we offloaded our vehicles and uh, uh, about three or four years ago. Uh, it was named Gores, G-O-R-Z. It had one store in it and that was tobacco mostly. Uh, and this is just an observation. And we walked uh, about three kilometers to where we were gonna make the crossing, which uh, the name of that town was Corny. <laughs> uh, 
and they uh, on the I guess in the three or four or five o'clock in the morning, my company commander uh, called for me. We were stopped on the uh, away from the river, and we found out that it was somewhat flooded, which made it harder to uh, deal with the, the boats that we were going to be in. And uh, he asked for me, and and this was the first time that he'd asked. And with some expertise, he said, "I believe you the one. Your your platoon is the one to to lead us up that hill." And uh, frankly, we weren't. I guess we would, we'd have done the same thing, but uh, we didn't know that two uh, crossings had failed. Uh, one to our left and one to our right. But uh, at daylight, we were in the boats and charging up. And, and waiting a little bit, and um, had heavy fire from the hill, and we we learned that uh, that had been a practice area for the German military school that was nearby. I was carrying only a carbine, and I, we all we had were rifles, uh, the M1 rifle and uh, uh, Browning automatic rifles. Uh, we had in each platoon one bazooka. Uh, and that was kind of bad news because if the uh, ammunition fins were slightly bent, you know, it didn't go in the direction he aimed it. I gave the order that we fix bayonets this time, which was the first time, and I, I really the only time that I did that. And it was a frightening kind of thing. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure none of our men that day uh, used the bayonets on anybody, but uh, we finally were able to get to almost to the top of the hill beyond this resistance. And they didn't have any mechanized uh, opposition at the time. Uh, we uh, had a lot, of, a lot of casualties. The Germans discovered that we were, uh, we were on the water pretty, pretty quickly. And uh, uh, as we got to the top, we had orders to try to, that a little town uh, uh, named Ari had been evacuated, uh, and uh, and our approach. So sometime during uh, around midnight, uh, we were uh, uh, my platoon and another one were ordered to go into the town and try to get to the other side. Now the town would, uh, had fewer houses than this block does, I think. But it, there was always a wall, nearly always. So uh, one of the platoon that was uh, going in front of us uh, into the in, through the gate uh, almost immediately came on the fire, and it turned out the Germans had reoccupied the town pretty strongly, and they killed one of the officers and um, uh, uh, wounded another one, and meanwhile, on the approach up the hill, uh, the company commander had been injured. He he wouldn't be evacuated on a, uh, at first because he it was we were in such serious uh, fire, and then the medics finally got him on a uh, uh, litter to take him down the hill, and he was uh, killed then by artillery. As, as they took him down. Uh, and that left, uh, well, we exited the town and uh, sort of stayed along the wall until we could find out what was going on and who was, who was left. Well, it turned out that uh, I was left, but a man who was senior was, was an officer, had been a weapons platoon commander, and uh, he was pitifully afraid uh and 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 really sick so uh as daylight came uh the, we knew we had to find some uh some cover somehow so i got all uh, uh the people from the company who who'd been about 155 or so uh the night before and i had 43 people uh left and uh of course, became company commander. That uh, and 
we, we, I was pretty bitter toward the other officer, although I knew that uh, even if he chose to join us, that I, I that we couldn't uh, count on him. But he did stay, uh, I mean, stay where he was, and uh, we left him there. And I, I, I asked all my men to walk right by him. Uh, I didn't want to do anything to him, but I, uh, that was the only punishment I could think of. But we went to some uh, uh, woods cover up on the side of the hill, and I, as I got them together, and uh, were well, uh, this this was a long day trying to get situated and then trying to protect whoever we could, and we got a lot of uh, uh, artillery in that area, and I thought at first that it was our artillery that we had ordered and that they were just uh, had become totally inaccurate. It turned out that the Germans in, in one of the forts had observation uh, on our positions, and they uh, they were listening to my request, for, and when our artillery fired, it, it went where I told them you know, wanted it to, but they fired at the same time right into us. Uh, that's one of their tricks, is they, and they, of course they were. Uh, we knew they were listening to uh, most any radio transmission, pretty much, and uh, we. Uh, suffered some more casualties that night, and that's, that's uh, I, I was more emotional about that the next morning, I think, than, than any other time. Oh, that's hard to gauge, but uh, I'd lost some of my, some of the guys, and one who'd been a clown for the company and could always uh, come up with something funny. But I asked to be, uh, use somewhere. I, I said, we cannot stay here, be foolish, uh, and be suicide. Well, the black battalion commander said, I don't know enough about the situation to tell you where. So he said, will you do that? And I did, and I discovered a gap between a uh, company adjoining us and and I don't even know who else on on the other side and didn't know then. But I realized we'd be pretty vulnerable, and uh, without any heroics whatsoever, I, it was a very practical thing, and I didn't think I was doing any anything that uh, I uh, wasn't expected to do. But it turned out that the counterattacks for the next uh, almost a week came right at that gap, which apparently the enemy had discovered, and we were able to, the, the whole bridgehead was was able to hold simply because of that. And they, they apparently discovered uh, the gap before we arrived, because this was the second day uh, of our, uh, in that uh, general uh, position, so that they directed their nighttime counterattacks. So they thought they had, um, the perfect way to uh, penetrate our defense, and that's exactly why they they chose that small area, which was probably oh less than a hundred yards. And we just had people spread out, and it was just turned out that it was very strategic. We had asked for air force uh, air support. Uh, and when some tank German tanks appeared on the on the hill, and uh, they reported that they saw about 500 bodies out front. Now, uh, anybody exaggerated in any direction, and we certainly did. We knew that our, our the gap or, or what we had done had been very successful. Uh, and incidentally, the air force that we asked for. Uh, two planes came, and uh, they were the ugliest plane we had, the P-47, but it's been my favorite even even till now. But uh, they made a couple of circles and, and did drop a dud right right close to us, a 500-pound bomb, but they one, one hit one of the German tanks, 
uh, just really knocked its track out, which of course completely disabled it. And that was enough to make them uh, back away. And the, the pilots realized that, and one of them uh, flew back around and almost at treetop level uh, just uh, tilted and, and um, saluted me as he did. And I, I wished a thousand times I could have known who it was and, and uh, where he's from and that sort of thing. But, that was a that that was a thing, and it was a complete surprise for uh, I think to at least uh, three months later that I found out that I'd been awarded the Silver Star for that operation. I I I didn't even know anybody had enough details about it because of it. and even now in the coverage has been, uh, Metz has mentioned it being very important in the Battle of Arneville, but there's so little uh, actual uh, coverage with pictures and, and so on. There's been some criticism of Patton for ordering us to attack across the river with the presence of the forts because there were, I think, 10 forts surrounding Metz and all of them, they were very, very old forts, but the Germans had modernized them, and the one that had the observation on us, which we were challenged to try to capture later on, which uh, an operation that, that really failed, uh, the commander of that fort told some of our people, command people later on, said, well, uh, while you were trying to capture us on, above the ground, uh, I was listening to beautiful German music and ultimate safety. Actually, the forts were, had generally had five floors, and they had all sorts of the guns were operated uh, elect uh, hydraulically, I guess, and they would come up and open kind of things, and then go back in. They, they were they were pretty close to being impregnable as far as the infantry was concerned. We were out of gas, we found out, and we didn't, it couldn't even get, gasoline was used for the, um, our kitchens for hot food, and we weren't accustomed to having hot food on a regular basis anyway, but they couldn't even use that. Uh, and a lot of stories about patent sending officers, you know, to steal gas and that sort of thing. I don't know how much of it was true. Uh, he did pull his rank on a lot of people. But meanwhile, uh, the Germans were able to uh, move back into Metz, and uh, even though they had, we'd had patrols in Metz this earlier time, uh, it took us two months to really get into Metz simply because they had uh, uh, sent maybe five divisions in there to defend it. Later, my company, though, had the, had the privilege of being the first one in the interior. We were ordered to uh, try to get into the edge of Metz in a certain spot, and it turned out during the night that there were uh, people, you know, so many uh, guns in opposition, and they discovered what we were trying to do. That we were really pushed back, and we took cover in about in three little houses along the Strasbourg uh, Highway right outside the city. And uh, we reported that to our battalion commander, and he said, well, uh, stay where you are or come back to where you started or whatever. And I said, well, neither one of those will work. Uh, if we stayed where we were, we'd be completely exposed, even though we'd be in houses, you know, they'd, they'd find out we were there. And the only time that I ever asked, I said, I, I asked for permission to use volunteers and uh, with some expertise, the battalion staff member said, try it if you want to, you know, and I can't tell you anything else to do. And this wasn't smart, you know, big deal, smart. This was this was the only practical thing to try. Although I 
fully expected it to fail. So one direction we didn't hadn't seen uh, any German fire, and uh, it was across a uh, sugar beet field, and uh, it was terrible. Cause I asked, I said, I'm gonna go first, and you just pass the word that anybody's going with me, just get back on me. I'm not gonna look back. I would prove it, and I didn't until I went across the. Uh, start across the beet field, and we'd had a lot of rain, and it was very muddy. And the toughest walking I have ever experienced was across a sugar beet field with the beets half out of the ground and the mud all in between because you couldn't see where you were uh, stepping. So that, that was pretty noisy. We got to the place that um, between some houses on the very edge of the, of the city. Uh, we were their back doors were toward us and toward the field. And we started between those houses and uh, I discovered that there was, uh, I saw a German sentry with a rifle on his shoulder. Uh, so I was pretty sure we'd had it by then. Well, he turned and looked the other way and I, I'll never know why he was, he was, I guess, within 50 or 75 feet because it had started to uh, get get light, and uh, uh, he didn't sound the alarm, and we just walked on through between the houses. By the time we got to a street, there was a, uh, uh, we started seeing German people leaving their their billets, uh, uh, just hopping out of houses, you know, and starting up the street. Uh, they thought to work, and uh, there was such a surprise, and they were so willing, that particular group was so weary at the time that, that they just handed us their weapons. And, and uh, between daylight and about 11 o'clock, we captured about 500 people with no resistance. I mean, we had to find a courtyard and, that we could close the gates and put them in there, but I believe they'd all stayed there forever if we let them. Uh, meanwhile, we passed by a military hospital on this street that we'd entered, and uh, somebody said that wanted to see the officer in charge, and, and uh, so I was a few feet back, and by then some of them got, I was talking to somebody as we got along, maybe talking to some some of the German prisoners. And uh, at the gate of the hospital, there was a tall civilian uh, who said, uh, "If you will wait a few minutes, uh, the commandant would like to see you and surrender the hospital." And I said, "Well, I, we have very little time." It turned out the commandant was getting dressed, and he came out. Uh, straightening his uniform and so on in a very formal way. He saluted and handed me a little uh, very small pistol and said, it's all yours, now we'll work for you. And uh, he, he said that he had seven American prisoners that he'd like somebody to visit. Uh, they'd like for me to visit and uh, of course I couldn't do it right then, but I promised that I would. Um, he then, uh, after we moved on and kind of took position in a couple of semi-high-rise apartment buildings, uh, he sent a messenger uh, uh, inviting me to eat dinner with him. And uh, he was a colonel, uh, he actually from Koblenz, I think. And, knew his name then, I don't, I don't remember now, but uh, I said, well, okay, tell him I'll come and I'll get to see the guys. And uh, of course, some of my cohorts said, you're crazy. Uh, no telling what he'll do. Well, I, I, uh, I just didn't think this doctor was gonna do anything bad. It was a pretty good uh, hot dinner inside, you know, all closed in with candles and uh, 
But meanwhile, he asked me to see the, the Americans. Uh, they were out of, were complete out of plaster of Paris. And these guys uh, who were in casts were in concrete casts. And they must have weighed hundreds of pounds. And of course, they couldn't move. Them. But the worst thing was they wanted water because we knocked out their water supply, and, and they had only they'd had the only wine for uh, several days, which doesn't quench your thirst, <laughs> as anybody knows. Very pitiful. Well, we immediately gathered up our canteen, can, canteens uh, and shared our water with them, and that 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 was a great experience. We were supposed to have a big ceremony the next day, and it turned out we were the first ones in the, in the city. But we, one of the forts had become more active, and we were ordered to, instead of having, the, having a little fun in the downtown Nets, to, to go to the uh, fort and offer to uh, for them to surrender or uh, we'd back away a thousand yards and bomb the fort off the map. And believe it or not, the German commander said, well, we've been told that before, if you can get the Air Force. So he refused. We backed off. And the, the clouds were too much for the Air Force, so we missed that again. And they, some of them held out till they were out of food, which they'd been ordered to do. They were not a huge danger once we surrounded them, of course. After Metz, um, the 95th Division joined us, and, and uh, the, uh, the highway out uh, toward the German border was, of course, very important. Uh, that's where some of them had, had escaped. Uh, but beyond that, then, we headed straight to the German border in the, in the Saar Valley. Uh, we dreaded it worse than any other place because we knew the Germans were going to defend their homeland like like nothing else, uh, and uh, they thought they could do it. And they had the, the 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 coal mines and that sort of thing were perfect places to hole up and and wait for. Us. We. Uh, one day, we, we, my own foot, we arrived at a railroad that was right on the border. And uh, it turned out, as we tried to cross that little railroad onto it, uh, we really wanted to say we were in Germany, you know, that we'd gotten there. Uh, we needed to do it carefully, of course, but we drew fire down the railroad, which is the perfect place to shoot a machine gun, any other kind. And... Uh, my runner and I, which was somebody who was supposed to be with me with the radio uh, all the time, uh, a couple of us uh, uh, kind of stopped in a, in a little depression among some trees. And this was one of the three times when I was aware that a German sniper fired at me in particular. And the bullet was probably two inches above my helmet and, and uh, my runner, who uh, was pretty funny a lot of the times anyway, he said, that has your name on it. And, and as he said that, there was a little sawdust from the exit of the bullet trickled down between our faces. So it, we, we realized it was pretty accurate. Uh, then in that area, we cleared the little towns uh, to, to try to saw Lauderdale and saw Brucking and the, and smaller towns, uh, and then while we were relatively quiet on on the on the near the near side at the, in the German border, <coughs> uh, we my battalion commander and his exec came to found up where we were, and we had hot food then. It turned out we were, we were having steak, which had been fresh the day before, something. Like, and the battalion commander, we asked the mess sergeant, says, Colonel, would you like a sandwich? 
And he said, were well, you going to tell me where it came from? And he said, no, sir. <laughs> but I explained there had been a wandering cow you know, through the area the day before, I think. Anyway, uh, they said that they were there to tell us. It had been word that it was, uh, the Germans were preparing an offensive, hopefully toward the east, because they'd gathered uh, panzer divisions that we did not know they had. Uh, somehow we didn't know they would have that capability. And they <clears throat> expected they were going to launch it. It looked like they were going to launch it uh, right away. And I said, well, I sure hope it's toward the east. And they left. And then that that night or the next night, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, we were told that they had launched the attack. <clears throat> apparently with the objectives of uh, Liège and, and uh, Antwerp, uh, and that they'd hit some of our units and that they had a lot of, a lot of Germans wearing American uniforms. And we were told to, uh, that the password, uh, which is the way you got past any guard into another area, would be changed twice a day. It was hard enough to do it once a day, but somehow I got in my Jeep and we were trying to gather up and uh, find out what next we were going to do. Somebody stepped in front and said uh, uh, that they wanted to know the password. Neither one of us could think of it. We asked for time and we were fine to be able to do it, but one of the things that they warned you against. One of the, the, the Germans who were going to be close by, who were going to pretend to be Americans, uh, learned cuss words and baseball statistics. It was interesting that for the most part they chose uh, uh, those things to sound like, uh, you know, America, somebody speaking English. Uh, then Really, in a very short time, we were told that, that uh, at dark we were supposed to uh, get on the vehicles, any we could find, and they, they were going to line them up. And we did that and uh, uh, were, were ordered for the first time to have vehicles turn on headlights and travel as close as possible. Of course, there were two things. That, you never did. You never showed a light, even lit a cigarette um, outside uh, un until then. And um, another thing was you kept a great distance between the de certain distance between vehicles. But this was uh, to get our whole division uh, up to Luxembourg and to commit us in uh, uh, the Sour River area and. Uh, that's when the, we'd had some snow already, uh, and that was in uh, uh, December. Uh, but that's when we saw the real snow, uh, and that was our entry into the Battle of the Bulge. And that was, of course, extremely tough. The weather was a, an enemy, uh, as well as they, they had, uh, they were, they were doing a lot of things to defend our our retaking the the bulge. What we were trying to do was to push the bulge back, and we were on the south uh, southwest arm of it. Mm -hmm. The objective was simply to take hill after hill, town after town, and the, it made it, it, was, it was a lot harder because of the the mountainous area of Luxembourg. Absolutely beautiful. And uh, the the uh, area was so pretty with the snow, and and but it was so deep, and there were times when you know when a, oh, a guy could use a use a pick uh, in the ice, and 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 all it did was keep him warm. It didn't uh, um, uh, couldn't dig a couldn't dig a hole, and sometimes if you did, you found uh, bodies of Americans uh, deep in the snow, and uh, for three years they've kept finding many bodies uh, in 
in that area. Uh, it's in that area nearby uh, where Patton is buried now at, at Ham, which is a uh, cemetery about 15 miles outside Luxembourg City. A part of this uh, attack was to go through a lot of uh, planted uh, uh, fir trees with fire breaks and that sort of thing. And we were assigned one particular hill. Uh, my company and the company, uh, the A company. But the fire break is, is a, uh, a space between uh, sections of trees where uh, if there's a forest fire, um, they, can, they can get to it and, and usually wide enough that the fire won't, won't jump. And the Germans were very careful and very efficient about that. Every tree looked like a beautiful Christmas tree. Uh, Christmas Eve night, we'd had a hard time, and the, the company had joined us had, had been completely overrun by German tanks, and I heard a friend of mine, the last I've ever heard of him, and I, I, I don't know what happened to him, but he was in command of that group, and uh, as they approached, uh, we could hear them and could hear him on the radio, and his plea was, what shall I do, what shall I do? And uh, they did the best. They did the best they could to the defense, and I'm sure uh, most of them were captured. But we were in a little safer area down on the side of of the mountain, and uh, chose to be as quiet as possible. And some of my closer friends I, uh, told me that uh, uh, that there's a barn right here that we can get in the lower part and uh, it'll be warmer. And uh, we did that, and somebody from the mail outfit showed up. This was 11 o'clock Christmas Eve and had a box of cookies for me, and they were all broken up, were sent by the wife of an officer I'd known at Fort Jackson. But then the next day <clears throat> was the question of advance to the, uh, downside of the hill, and you can see the, val the valley in front of us is simply beautiful with little hotels and bed and breakfast along the, the streams and rivers. <clears throat> but uh, about the middle of the afternoon, just before it started to get dark, <coughs> uh, my uh, our medic uh, that was with us at the time, uh, who's the wonderful buddy of everybody and did a lot more than just fix wounds. He'd go get water for us and, all, and always did it in a hurry. Uh, asked me, uh, and I was standing alone, and he says, I've, I've seen two German, uh, uh, a German officer and enlisted man, they were wounded back, close back. Uh, the IV permission to go fix them up. Well, uh, it was late, almost dark, and I had, uh, uh, I said, I, I was reluctant to do that. I said, a little rather you not, uh, and because you shouldn't go alone, nor should I stay here alone, or any of us. And uh, he said, well, I'll be real quick, and I, I won't, uh, I'd really like to do that. And this is who he was, a very compassionate uh, young man, about 20, I guess, or 19. And uh, uh, his, uh, another sergeant asked me where, where Castle is. And I said, well, he asked me about uh, fixing up two Germans. And I said, I'll try to find him. And uh, so I went in the direction and found the fire break and walked down the edge of it and found that he had been killed and uh, the two uh, Germans were still alive and of course they were writhing at my approach because they, they knew what would happen to him and at first I knew what I would do uh, and as I cocked my carbine and uh, they both looked up at me helpless as they could be. Uh, 
I thought that this is Christmas Day, and if I survive, I'll always remember that that I killed two uh, uh, helpless people, even though they were the enemy. So I didn't do it, and uh, I sent word to some of our uh, medics coming up to, that they should be evacuated, and we understood that they were okay. But uh, my medic was lying there with a, a hole through his helmet and through his head uh, with his hand still under the wounded elbow of, of uh, the enlisted uh, man, German. And that was, a, that was another very emotional time. And in fact, it was, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I don't think I'm tougher now, but I can, it's, it's been long enough that I, but I guess it was 15 years before I, I could tell that story. And I finally wrote it for uh, inclusion in Tom Brokaw's book and, and sent it out as an email to some friends. I, I had seen uh, the movie Saving Private Ryan and, and had the experience of having a Private Ryan that, uh, uh, with a message from Eisenhower to get so-and-so out and his three brothers had been uh, wounded or killed and uh, it's the same as I think the situation with Private Ryan. I, incidentally, there were seven Incidents is like that, I understand, in World War II, where a single survivor of uh, siblings uh, was taken out of combat because he was ordered to sit down. Like the 21st of January, I had orders to uh, get my, had a messenger come and, and uh, say for me to join the uh, battalion commander. Uh, wherever he was in the snow, and it was hard driving, even though it wasn't a great distance. And they, that's when they told me that I'd been company commander two or three times now. I, I, they had applied about, for my promotion, and I said, well, I'm not ambitious uh, in that respect. I also am not a gambler, but I'm realistic. I've been here longer than anybody else except one guy. And the odds are uh, that I won't be here a lot longer and uh, to get that uh, promotion to captaincy, but I appreciate it. Well, I was hit the next day, actually, and uh, didn't get it for a good while after spending about uh, uh, almost four months in the hospital in England. It was a sort of a, of a typical day. I was in the area... Uh, just outside on the high ground uh, near Dekirsch, uh, which is a beautiful little resort town and, and uh, incidentally has the best uh, uh, American equipment museum there that, that's in Europe actually now. Uh, and I, I was, uh, uh, we had been slept out and tried to sleep out in the snow in the edge of town next to buildings uh, uh, for the night before and had were really trying to figure out how we could make some make some more progress and uh, uh, late in the afternoon still you know really mid afternoon but toward uh, uh, dark time. Uh, I observed, I was in a woody area and I observed some Germans who were pretty much exposed and they were in and we had on, by then we had on uh, uh, white uh, camouflage hooded uh, suits and, and that kind of thing and uh, by uh, artillery uh, uh, attached uh, guy who was a, uh, an officer w with the artillery unit, observer, actually, and his radio man came to where I was. I was standing in a, a shallow hole, actually, a little little more than knee deep, and 
just for a little bit of protection. And uh, they knelt down to talk to me, and as we were talking, then it's when a mortar shell hit. Apparently, the Germans had observed us too, and uh, I uh, killed the two people, the two artillery people. Uh, they, uh, and uh, my another platoon uh, leader, who'd been a replacement, was wounded in the face, obviously, and he couldn't, I could never, I could not get him to uh, move his hands uh, to see how badly he wounded, and then I, by then I could see blood on my uh, uh, white uh, clothing, and, uh, and it, it, it didn't, you didn't bleed profusely very early, it was simply because of the cold weather. Now, actually, during the time that I was there, we had 10 days when the temperature didn't get above zero. And uh, that was, as I said, uh, a real enemy in itself. Uh, and, of course, very, there were some civilians left, and they, were, they had been uh, occupied and then uh, uh, liberated, and then now they were occupied again. And they, they were so bitter about what all had gone about the, the Germans. The, the, the Luxembourg people were so supportive, and I think always have been, the times I've been back, so supportive of the, of the Americans and appreciative of their liberation, as are most of the people in Europe, you know. Well, I, I tried to stay there. I was, I was fully conscious, even though I was uh, my face was numb and, and uh, I had no idea how serious or how many uh, wounds I, I had and, and uh, it turned out one piece of shrapnel creased my, my helmet and one cut my clothing right here and one went through my canteen of water uh, back here but one had, had hit the, my officer's insignia, which was, of course, under another collar, and bent it and ricocheted up into my throat between the uh, jugular vein and windpipe. I discovered later on uh, that, that it was an emergency kind of thing, so back in Luxembourg, and the hospital was in a convent. Uh, uh, they started surgery about uh, uh, midnight, and it lasted about four hours simply because they were not able to use the instruments. They had to widen the wound and then use use their fingers where they could feel to keep from moving it. And then I had uh, three pieces in my back, small pieces, one in my arm and one in my leg above the knee. Very fortunate. After the hospital in Luxembourg for a few days, and that was a uh, that was a blank simply because they had to, they were so busy they had to give you enough medication so that you didn't bother people much. And I uh, uh, after about a week, uh, we were taken down the hill by the railroad track and the, the train, and uh, we were. Uh, loaded, put in a tent until they got everything situated. And they had box cars with racks to put uh, to put uh, the wounded people in, and with a wood heater in the middle and a, a nurse for every box car. And, uh, and back to Paris, and there a few days, and uh, a little more surgery, and then to uh, uh, England via Le Havre. Uh, in the uh, hospital in the Salisbury Plain. There were five hospitals in the group there. It had been a British military inst installation for a long time, and still is, actually. Uh, I was there till about the time the war ended. And after the capture of Metz, uh, we didn't have any embedded uh, media people. They were kept completely out, but uh, they were very quickly, the 
I guess a day or two after our entry into Nets, uh, several people found us, and one reporter from was with the Associated Press from Atlanta, uh, and the next day I learned later there were some headlines in the Atlanta paper about a Georgia boy and his appearance in Mets, and and uh, uh, it, it was very very exciting for my family to be able to read about. It. I I had some communication. I I had a cousin who was um, a medic with a hospital. Uh, not far from where, um, at, at Salisbury, and I was about, we were a few miles from Salisbury. Uh, and um, somehow I, I knew his unit, I didn't know where the hospital was, but I was able to get somebody to find out, and they told him, and he communicated a couple of times, and uh, uh, I, the, Communications that I sent and he sent that well, I was okay and so on. But then he got a chance to come to see me, and uh, he realized that he had knew nothing about my wounds. And he stood at the end of the ward, about the uh, old oh, sixty feet away for a while before you approached the bed and found out I had uh, arms and legs and so on, and. Uh, he reminded me, and then I sensed from a communication from my parents that they'd like to know more about it. And uh, I, you know, told them where the wounds were and maybe told them about my paralysis and death on this side for a while. And uh, I decided that I should get a photograph made uh, if I could. And so when I got to be ambulatory, I, I uh, borrowed some uh uniform and infantry insignia and went to a uh, professional photographer in uh, uh, Salisbury and had a picture made that I, and I sent that to him. That's really the only one of two we've got with, in my uniform. I was just out in, the, in a rehab uh, uh, situation there and uh, uh, had really been assigned along with a group of other people who were out of the hospital to uh, meet with uh, uh, soldiers who had been clerks and that sort of thing and had not had any infantry training and begin to train them and tell them uh, about combat so that they would have some more training and go to the Pacific because the war wasn't over there, of course. And uh, that that was that was a tough kind of thing. We were all, they were in all of us. We all had been in the hospital. We'd all been in combat, and uh, it was uh, uh, it's pretty hard. And, my, and that assignment had, had that, that came along, you know, after the war ended. I remember I did an inspection one time of one of the little barracks area, and. I heard the guys arguing about what had happened to me, and uh, one said he knew that I'd just been shot through the neck, and another one said no, he he knew that a German bayonet had done it. <laughs> Neither of which was right, but it, I, I I didn't go back in there, and, and I and I uh, I don't know whether I ever dealt with it again, but it was kind of funny to hear that speculation, just like soldiers do and other people do in the group area anyway. I got home um, uh, 2 a.m. Christmas morning uh, in 1945. My parents had picked me, I'd been to, uh, came on a, home on a carrier, uh, the Lake Champlain, which had not seen service in the war but was finished uh, in time to be a troop ship. I'd gone overseas with a total of 200 crowded on a banana boat and came back with the 5,000 passengers on the Lake Champlain. Uh, we were on a train uh, from New York to Augusta, and uh, it was so cold the water froze there on the train, and we had to 
stop a couple of extra times on the siding and get water and sandwiches uh, for us. Uh, now, you know, that was like a day and a half trip or something like that. But my parents were already there. They didn't know when I was going to get there. And they'd been there a couple of days. And uh, on the way home, we realized in Atlanta from Augusta that there was ice on the ground. And we uh, proceeded to Rome. And as we passed Kennesaw, a car came over the top of the hill and did not know it was icy and he hit his head on and totaled the car and there was a bus back of us and the bus driver, Greyhound bus, and the bus driver said, I, I'll take your parents. Uh, and uh, my dad wasn't, he, he had, uh, was sore, but that was about it. My mother, my mother had a little bleeding knee. But he brought them to the hospital in Rome, and I stayed there to look after the car and try to get something done, and a wrecker showed up. And he took the car back to, uh, I guess, his yard, as wrecker drivers did. And I had to talk him in and then pay him what I thought was an enormous sum of $20, because he had the chains to bring me to Rome. And um, I arrived at the hospital at 2 a.m. to uh, go with my family. A neighbor had brought, had come to get them and me too. I'm, I'm, I'm emotionally involved in the fact that we've got a war going on that I, we ought not to have. Uh, I, my prayer for the troops, whether it be my relatives or, or somebody I don't know, is is that they get away somehow honorably uh, uh do what you have to do and don't in in and, and don't uh defy orders but pray hard all the time that this thing will be wound up and that we can we can have uh just a little bit of peace in the world it's it's there's none now and we can't help people that as much that have AIDS, and we can't help people, the poverty-stricken people because we're we're involved in doing too many other things. I, 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 I my advice would be to do all you can uh, to make peace, starting with yourself.